Let's go to our third part of our sermon on Thessalonians. Anybody remember what the first one was? I know it's been two weeks. Firm in faith. What was the second one? Firm in suffering, and today is firm in righteous living. It is very difficult for us to keep our testimony if we lose the righteousness that we're supposed to be walking with. How many of you walk in your own righteousness, or how many of you are walking in the righteousness of Christ? And when we do our righteousness, I want you to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew 6, verse 33. And it's on page 1499 of your pew Bible. And this is a key verse because this is talks about what are we supposed to be doing as Christians. Not only putting on the breastplate of righteousness so that people can see Christ in us, but what is our purpose? What was the whole purpose of us being down there in, on, the, on, on the streets down there during the circus week? It's for this verse. If you remember this verse, you can find that your walk and your strength in your walk will be increased if you do not forget this verse. Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And all these things that, that Matthew's talking about will be given unto you, but you've got to seek out the kingdom of God. And many times we're seeking out the kingdom of First Christian Church or the kingdom of the First Baptist or the kingdom of Main Street Methodist. Or Main Street. We're looking for our own little empire instead of the kingdom of God. We need to be focused on bringing in people. Jesus says, for he came to bring the kingdom of God into our lives. And many people say, that is the gospel, by the way. We, are to, we accept Christ. We come to the cross. We get washed by his blood. We are justified, and then we're sanctified by his righteousness. But we do it for the purpose of the kingdom of God. We don't do it for the purpose of First Christian Church. We don't do it for the purpose of one little congregation somewhere. We do it because we are now aliens in this world, and we are now citizens of the kingdom of heaven. How much better it would be if we were all walking, seeking the kingdom of God, and not our own little empire? How much more would the church reach, and how much more would the world be changed? Back in 1980s, it was amazing. Anybody remember the, the economy of the 80s? You know, people were talking about, well, the 80s, the economy was so good. But do you want to realize something? America. America supported 85% of all mission work around the world. Some say 85, some say 90, but that's about 85%. And we were blessed because of it. Let me tell you the shame of this. Do you know what percentage of the contributions that were given to churches in America actually went to missions? Tried less than 1%. Less than 1% of all the income of all the churches in America was supporting 85 to 90% of all missions around the world. And God blessed us with less than 1% given to missions. Can you imagine what we could have done if it was 10% of the money brought into the churches that had gone into missions? Could you imagine the impact that we could have in the kingdom of God? Barna, in 2020, or actually come back before that, but he put it out in 2020. Right now, America, we support 25% of missions around the world. How's our economy doing? Think about it. 
So how and what are we supposed to do? Well, we've got to live this righteous life. We've got to live a life that people can see in us. You know, I just heard this morning with an ex-police officer wanted to come over and shake our hands. We did a simple thing, and I just heard that this morning, a testimony. He saw us giving a police officer a cold bottle of water. And he was so impressed by that. Was there a gospel preached there? What was done there? Showing the love of Christ in a practical way with no strings attached. Showing that the righteousness of Christ. The police officers have a tough job. He said, well, they get paid. Uh, Fine. All right? How many of you have served in the military? How many have been shot at in the military? I will tell you, it's not fun. Oh, but you're getting paid. It's not fun. And I looked at these police officers walking down there with their Kevlars and all their stuff that had decked out. I was in a, in a, in a short-sleeved shirt, and I was burning up. But what we do is what people see. And it's the righteousness that we need to live in. The life of faith is a marathon, though. Here's the issue. We can't just do it one weekend a year or one week a year. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And we need to stay committed to what God has called us to do, stay on the path of righteousness day in and day out. It cannot, we cannot put on this righteousness for a show. I will tell you, people can read through the show. People can read when you're fake. Now, how many went to the circus? Can I ask you a question? What was more, what's more comfortable, the benches in the circus or the chairs you're sitting in right now? How long was the circus? Okay, just, just, just thinking about it. Okay? So I guess you guys like clowns better than Christ, so that's all right. Just putting it out there. Just keep your righteousness on. There you go. Your grandkids should be here. As you may remember, the church in Thessalonica, remember we talked about it, is one of the churches established by who? By Paul. On it, anybody remember what missionary trip it was? The second missionary trip. That's why you go to Bible studies, by the way. That's why you go to Sunday school, to learn these things. You don't learn them all here. Life, like many other Roman cities at the time, Thessalonica was divided, <clears throat> was a diverse, divided culture, had many different cultures in the, tr- in the city, had many different faiths, had many things going on. Not much, not much different than what's going on in America today. There were certain groups that were more powerful than others. There were certain groups that wanted things going on. And Paul brings this church, a new church, a new understanding of what Christ had done and what Christ was bringing, the freedom that he was bringing in. But they were not very welcomed. And they weren't very welcomed because... In religion, that's why I'm not part of a religious group. I'm part of the body of Christ. I'm not religious. Because in religion, there's control. And they want to control you through the religion. In other words, hey, you know what? You know, I was talking to somebody this, this morning, and I'm not going to say who he was, but but Ralph said we should, uh, we should raise a, you know, a gym loft recovery fund. And so we're going to pass the offering plate. And the more money you put in the offering plate, the quicker I will recover. How many believe that? Would I lie to you? Yeah. <laughs> But religion would say things like that. That's religious. 
what we need to do is have the righteousness of Christ on us whenever and whatever we do. You know, many of theirs amount of hostility towards Christians back in that time. And that hostility is starting to come to America. It's starting to show up in the streets of America, showing up in Canada, showing up around the world. But we're seeing something that we have never seen in America before. It's an all-out assault on our faith. And the reason is, is because the churches across America went to sleep. We stayed in our little pretty little temples our pretty little ta- uh, tabernacles, our pretty little buildings, you know, with all kinds of things. I love the story down in South Carolina, and I don't know how true it is, but there's a story that came out, and it was a nice little church in South Carolina right there on the beach, and it was one of those big, beautiful buildings, white buildings with pillars on it, marble floors coming in, and the story goes that One Sunday morning, they were all sitting there and they had all their deacons and their ushers and they're all in their proper clothes and their suits and, you know, just all this proper attire. And a beach bum walks in. And he's wearing cut off jeans and raggedy t shirt and no shoes. And he walks right down the center aisle. And everybody stops. And everybody starts looking at him. And the pastor even stops preaching and goes, oh. And he comes down to the center and he sits on the floor. And then you hear this, teak, teak. An older gentleman, very distinguished gentleman, one of the deacons, walking with a cane. And everybody's going, oh, man, he's going to give it to that guy. He's going to really show him. Because this guy was out of place. But the way the story goes is that old man came down and sat next to him on the floor. And the pastor looked up, closed his Bible, and goes, there's your sermon. We need to get out of this crystal palace that we think we are part of and get into the community and be open to those that want to come and show the righteousness of Christ. As much as has been said, many people don't understand us. We are accused of being exclusively an exclusive little club. In a way, they're right. Because Christianity is inclusive. And This only because we are one of the few organizations or groups of people, the true church, the ones that truly has the righteousness of Christ, believe what John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. You see, we preach there's only one way to heaven, through Jesus Christ that was crucified on the old rugged cross. And it is through believing in him and his blood and putting on his righteousness gets us into heaven. There is no other way. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't pay your way. You can't do things. You cannot work your way into heaven. You must accept Jesus Christ. And when we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ because everything that we do, we do it because we are the living representation of the true church that died, that was resurrected 2,000 years ago. Are you carrying that righteousness with you? Or is it only a Sunday morning cliche? Are we doing the things that we're supposed to do day in and day out? Admittedly, Christianity is a, has a, a very narrow road. It is not open to whatever you want. It is not however you feel. The fact is, a liar, a cheater, and a thief will not go to heaven. Very simple. How do I know that? Because the Bible says liars, 
And thieves will not enter the presence of God. Sin cannot enter the presence of God. So how do I take care of my sin? I can't do it. I don't have the ability to do it. No matter what I try, I can't get rid of the sin. I use this example many times. Once you commit a sin, it's always there. You know, if I decided, if I walked down here, Jim Clary, and give him one of those big old smacks, bam, you know, those four-finger smacks, these are the four fingers in your, hand, in your face, Ask a question. If I did that, could Jim forgive me if he wanted to? Absolutely. Did it take the slap away? The slap is still there. It's forgiven, but it's still there. Our sins are still there, but it is covered now by forgiveness from who? Jesus Christ and the blood that was shed on Calvary. For his blood covers our sins... So how do we keep that covered sin if we're not living a righteous life? You cannot say I'm living a righteous life and live in sin. You can't sit there and go to the clubs, run the bars on Fridays and Saturdays, and then come to church and do your Hail Marys or whatever you want to do and ask God for forgiveness. Plan rebellion with plan repentance, there is no remission. It is a narrow road. And the road that we walk and shows our righteousness comes from the Word of God, not from religion and not from bylaws. It comes from what the Word of God says. How many of you hate a brother? What did the Bible say? What did Jesus say if you hate a brother? You've committed murder. You broke the Ten Commandments. How many of us have issues with church members. Not in this church, of course. We all get along. Everybody's so happy and surprised we don't come in with rose-colored glasses and little flowers, you know. No. We do get along, but there are people that don't. There are people that have a, have a critical spirit. And everything you do, everything you say is criticized. Have you ever felt that sometimes? That's not the righteousness of Christ. Once you start seeing that, see, these things are not to condemn you. What I'm talking about is to convict you. If you feel condemned by anything that is said from the Word of God, then it's the devil attacking you, and you can tell the devil to go to hell. If you are convicted... That's the Holy Spirit talking to you. That means you need to repent and change your ways. So you need to understand the difference between being condemned and being convicted. Conviction always brings you back to the cross. Conviction always brings you back to Jesus. Condemnation always takes you to the hell, to, to the devil. It always tells you that you're not worthy that you're not good enough. You haven't done enough. That's con condemnation. And no man, the Bible says no man, we have no power to condemn anybody. I may not like something that you do, or you may not like something that I do, but we do not have the authority to condemn that person. All we can do is help that person, pray with that person, and help that person to be restored and come back into the kingdom of God. Not condemn. Church discipline is designed not to punish, but to bring that person back into the graces of God. That is the righteousness that we need to be showing. The truth is, the human race, us, we are constantly presented with one or more choices. We're constantly presented with different things on how we can live. You could change your lifestyle. Don't worry about it. God's a God of love. He'll understand. You know, go out on Friday nights and party and, and commit adultery. Don't worry about it. God's a God of love. He'll understand. I will tell you, he will not understand. 
He will not sit there and say it's okay. How many of you have heard, come as you are to church? I believe that with all my heart. But I also tell you something else. Don't leave as you are when you come. Change your heart, your attitude. Put on that righteousness of Christ. You know, all of these religions, all of these things that are happening, many Christians are coming up and saying, well, I've got this decision fatigue. I've got this sin fatigue. I've got this tired of being told how wrong I am all the time. Church, listen. Put on the righteousness of Christ, not the righteousness of self and not the righteousness of this world. And yes, it may be uncomfortable sometimes. My shoulder surgery. I'm wearing this. This was was made by the SS to, to torture people. But what happens if I didn't wear it? It would, my shoulder would get worse. Sometimes you have to put on a strap to get better. Sometimes you need to go to Bible study on a Sunday morning, when, even when you don't feel like getting up in the morning, or a Bible study on a Saturday or a Friday or a Wednesday. How are we looking How are we going to demonstrate the love of Christ in a practical way if we don't even show that love and that compassion? And sometimes that compassion can be a pain. Okay? Sometimes it can be discomforting. And last week, we had a situation in our home that way. And you guys know that my wife kind of likes to rescue cats. Well, she drops me off at church, goes back, and sees a cat on the side of the road full of flies and ants and stuff sitting there. So what does she do? She picks him up, cleans her up, brings her to the house. And then she comes, picks me up and says, I got another cat. And first thing came in my mouth, I said, no. But you see, that is compassion. That is righteousness. Took the cat, took him to a vet. Well, she actually cleaned him up, fed her for a while, and we ended up having to put her down because she had so much stuff going on with the cat, but she's no longer suffering. And I told Tina, I said, well, at least for the last two or three days of her life, she had a warm place, a cool place to stay, fresh water, fresh food, and she was not being abandoned or forgotten. That is the righteousness of Christ. Do we do that to human beings? Are you willing to do that to a human being? Turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 and 2. It's on page 1810 of your pew Bible. First Thessalonians 4, verses 1 and 2. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and be pleasing to God. For you know that commandment we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. Right here, Paul is saying, finally, I mean, he's, he's talking good things about this church, but he's saying you've got to hold on, and you've got to continue, and you have to know that you have to keep those commandments that you were taught. Many churches today are changing the commandments of God. Many churches today are changing the Word of God. Many churches today are looking for translations that fit the theology versus changing their theology to fit the Word of God. 
<clears throat> if you have a theology, I don't care what it is, and it goes against the Word of God, you're wrong. Period. And here's the thing, church. I've done this. My theology has changed many times because as you grow, as you learn, you learn to fine-tune that theology and change it. And if you're wrong, just say, I was wrong. This is the graces that God gives us. We can be wrong. All we got to do is have our minds and our eyes open so that when the truth comes, we're not so proud not to change. Been preaching it for years. If it's wrong, change it. I used to preach all the time for many years. Young man, Jesus is at the door knocking. Are you going to let him into your heart? I used to preach it as a salvation message for years. And then I started studying it, and I went, wait a minute. This is not a salvation message. This is Jesus knocking at the door of the church, or is the church even going to let him in? I wonder today if Jesus came in here. One, would we recognize him? Two, would he recognize us as a follower of Jesus? How will he, how will he know unless we have the, right, the breastplate of righteousness put on? 1 Thessalonians, finally then. He's exhorting, he says, finally, guys, come on. Pay attention. Keep it up. He's an encourager. Paul is saying essentially, hey, you guys are living for Christ already. You guys are already doing it. I tell you this, church, you guys are already doing a lot of things. We're already reaching missionaries around the world. We got, we've helped churches in Kenya, Uganda, uh, Niger, Peru, South America, Haiti. We have done a lot of things around the world. That is a great thing. And that's what Paul was saying. Guys, you're doing a good thing. You're living for Christ already. But he says, just keep going. Do it more and more and more. Just don't think it's over. We have not crested that hill yet. We have not reached that victory point yet. We have not reached the place that we are finished. We still are in the run. And we're still fighting the battles. We're still in the call. It may seem like we're falling back a little bit, but we are pressing forward. This church is going to press forward against those darkness, against the spirit of darkness that's coming against the church today. And we will not compromise the Word of God. We will not compromise to make the people and the secular world happy with us. Jesus said, I came to divide. I came to bring division. What was he talking about? He said he's going to separate us from the world. We are a peculiar people. We are an individual. We are a group of people called individual under the name of Jesus Christ. Not bunches of Christians. Not a bunches of religions. Not a bunches of saviors. Not a bunches of other things. But one. Jesus Christ. Period. Are we wearing that out? Or are we wearing it just on our, on our coat sleeve? Look who I am for social media. It's like working, and some of you will remember this, working at a youth camp, fixing the siding and putting roof on, on, the, on the buildings out there, and one individual shows up, sprinkles water on him, and says, take a picture of me, like if he was doing anything. See, that is what you don't want to be. If you're going to sweat, then work at it. You know, I was, I was going to put a picture of, of Bob Katie coming out of a house down here that we were rebuilding. I, I love that picture because he'd come out of this house and rebuild it. He's covered with dirt from here to here. I mean, just black. See, that is get, giving it all to Christ, man. 
getting in there and doing something and not being afraid to get your no, fingernails hurt. Oh. You know, it's obvious that Paul here is, inst is instructing the church to listen. So let's listen to godly instructions. And I heard this yesterday from an individual here. You know, talked about this older, older lady, and she was dying, and she needed a blood transfusion. And they were looking for her. They couldn't figure out what her blood was. And so they're trying to, they had, she had to have it, otherwise she was going to pass away. And eventually the lady passed away. And they said, man, if we could only knew what blood she had, we could have helped her. And she goes, yeah, but she died very positive. And they go, really? She goes, yo, yeah. Did you notice every time we went to her, she kept saying, be positive, be positive. <laughs> Are we listening? God is speaking to us. Are we listening? First, the foremost thing we've got to admit that we have a very difficult time in listening and following instructions. We know that because if you've ever seen a man try to put something together, how many of you guys get a, something and you're going to put it together? The last thing you do is look at the instruction manual. Or Tina always tells me, you always got parts left over. <laughs> Why? Because you see, the devil has got into us that we don't need instruction, that we are so good and perfect, and that we know it all. Actually, we know nothing. We need to be instructed. And I will tell you something, Christians, and including me, don't ever get to the point that you're no longer teachable. No matter how old you are, if you're two years old or if you're 105 years old, you should always be teachable. Because that's how God molds us and shapes us and adjusts us for the season that he's going to move us into. Sometimes we go through hard times because God has a season that he knows we're getting ready to go into that he has to prepare us for that. And he can only do that if you're wearing the righteousness of Christ. Always be willing to learn. And I'm telling you, I'm not, I'm not preaching to the choir, preaching to myself. Why is it so difficult to listen and obey? You know, years ago, when my boys were small, my brother-in-law was taking him to a, uh, I think a unit party. He was in the Army. He was taking him to a unit party. And, and I remember him looking at Jimmy, and he tells Jimmy, he says, don't jump in the water in the, in the little, on the road. I laughed. I said, you know what you just did? You told him to go jump in that water. And what, did, what do you think that little boy did? Okay. Why is it so difficult for us to listen and obey? Because it comes from the fallen nature that we live in, who we are. And it all started in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve refused to obey and listen to God. Can you imagine walking in the presence of God in the cool of the day? And then all of a sudden finding out that you can't go near him now because you sinned. A baby is innocent until he starts doing what? Growing up and start thinking on his own, and then he starts what? You know, I remember telling my boys when they were 17, 18 years old, and of course, you know how, you ever had teenagers? Okay. I remember telling Jimmy, I says, you know what? You ought to stop right now. Go, what? I says, drop out of school, quit everything, and go out and make a million dollars because right now you know everything. Okay? 
And he says, I remember Jimmy looking at me and says, what do you mean? I says, Jimmy, remember, I was 17 at one time also. Okay? And I'm telling you things to help you. But what's our nature? I can do it myself. Look at Proverbs 19. You've heard this before. Verse 20. Listen to counsel and receive instructions that you may be wise in your latter days. Even in the Proverbs, it's telling us to listen to instructions so that we can learn. Whose advice and instructions are you listening to today? Is it Fox News, CNN, ABC? What instructions and fo- what are you following today? And I tell you, where a lot of people are getting all their instruction from is they've got this program on TV, I mean on, on computers, that is so wise, that's got so much information, that it knows so much that it will tell you everything you need to know. It's called Google. And I've had people tell me, says, well, I Googled it. That, that's not what Google says. What does the Word of God say? Well, I Googled it. I had a young man as a youth pastor. And I was teaching, trying to teach him how to research and find stuff so that you can write a sermon. So I gave him some information. I said, go research this for me and bring it back to me when you're ready. Five minutes later, he walks downstairs, put it on my desk. I says, what's this? He says, what's your research? I looked at it and said, okay, uh, this statement right here, who wrote that? He goes, what do you mean? I said, who wrote that? What's his background? What does he believe in? And where does he come from? Where is his standings? What does he teach? And what, does, what has he grown up? Where did he grow up at? And he goes, I Googled it. And I went, okay, answer these questions. And he looked at me and says, if I did that, it'd be a lot of work. <laughs> Hello? You see, we get to a point where we, we want it the easy way out. Study, read. I don't know who it was, but a politician or somebody said, I saw it on, on Facebook one day, and it says, don't be afraid to read every book in the library. In church, don't be afraid to read every book in the Word of God. All 66 books. You know, many of us know, I think it's a true statement, bad company corrupts good character. How many of you agree with that? And many times, it's our company that's that's derailing us. I remember with my boys, I told them, well, Dad, we're hanging out with these guys. I said, that's fine. As long as you are influencing them for good and they are not influencing you for evil. If you come in here and you're being influenced with evil, then you've got a problem. My first experience with that was in school when I was a young man. I was in Puerto Rico, and I learned a new word, ASS. And anyway, so we're in the car, my mom was driving, and... The guy was right in front of us, had a cow, and we were right behind him, and I said, look at that ASS. <laughs> uh, and my mom went, wham! You know, and then years later, I remember telling mom about that, and she says, yeah. I said, hey, mom, that word's in the King James, by the way. <laughs> but... What was it? See, it was the influence that I was receiving from my friends. And what my my mother was telling me is, no, you're not. You will not end up that way. You will not follow in that stuff. So, with all this said, what have we done? We are called to righteousness. God is calling us to righteousness. God is calling us to have a culture with Jesus Christ, not a culture that's in this world. Today, 
just like the Roman culture in the time of Christ was highly sexualized. One very similar to that was we experience today. I mean, I've seen some of these young girls walking down in the, in the, down there in downtown wearing clothes that, you know what? You just want to yell at her. You know, here you are, you are precious in the eyes of God. Why flaunt it? Why do that? You know, again, when I was bringing up my boys, we went and my wife got, ups- got like looking at me as if I had something wrong with me. She goes, what are you doing? I says, oh, I'm going to take Jimmy and Johnny. We're going to go to the mall. We're going to look at girls. And she's like, are you serious? I said, yeah, we went to the mall. And I'm sitting there and girls walk by. I said, Jimmy, what do you think of her? Oh, dad, yeah, she's hot, yeah. I says, no imagination, Jimmy. I mean, there's nothing there. I mean, you, you see everything. Now look at her. What do you think about her? What do you think about her? And what I was teaching them was to respect the woman properly dressed and show proper respect. And it worked. Remember one in college, huh? West Point, Tina had a top on, kind of a little bit low, had to us a little bit. And Johnny goes, Mom! <laughs> but you teach. But you teach through righteousness. And we're experiencing the same thing that the, the church in Thessalonica had in their situation. We're experiencing it today. And today's church is not immune to the temptations of the world. It's obviously evidenced by the time, how many times Paul had to address the topic in writing to the churches. Because even back then they were having difficulties, they're having difficulties today. Are we doing the same thing that the church did back then? Are we being encouraged by the word of God? Are we being discouraged by the world? You know, how many of you read the Bible? Okay, how many of you, how many of you know, know the Bible exists? Can I give you a, can I give you a, a hint? You really want to know how everything works out? Cheat a little bit. Read the back, last book of the Bible. We win. The devil gets destroyed. And we walk in the streets of gold. How do we get there? Is what is putting on the righteousness of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 and 8. Back on page 1810. For this is the will of God, your sanctification... We're sanctified, that God wants us to be what? Sanctified, that you should obtain from sexual immorality what's happening in the world today. And that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in a sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother or his... In, in this matter, so don't defraud your brother in this matter. What is? Don't tell him it's okay. And there's pastors today that are preaching that it's okay. You're defrauding your brother. You are cheating your brother. By not pointing out the sin, you are allowing that person to live in sin. And according to the Bible, if I do that, what happens to me? That sin becomes my sin. Now, people say, well, you shouldn't talk about that. The Bible says if you tell a brother about the sin and he does not repent, who's at fault? He is. But if he does repent, you have just saved a soul. Churches need to start speaking up. 
that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this manner because the Lord is the avenger of all such. And who's going to, so who's going to avenge these pastors that are preaching that homosexuality is okay? We? Us? No, God is. Of all such and who's, who, who we also forewarned you and testified for God did not call us to uncleanliness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has given him his one and only son, his Holy Spirit. So if you deny God and pull in the world, and you live according to the world, then who's going to, take it, who's going to be... Who's going to come against you? God is. I'd rather be, test, you know, in the Army, we used to have a thing, special forces. When we'd go into places, we had a saying. I'd rather be carried, no, I'd rather be tried by 12 than carried by 6. And what happened was, when I was in the Army, the government would give us these, these laws, these rules or orders that would get us killed. So we saw he's saying, no, I'm not going to obey that order because I am not going to end up in a casket. I would rather face a 12-man jury and a court-martial than be killed. That's a soldier's point of view. But what's the Christian's point of view? Do you want to end up in the second death? Or do you want to stand in front of a mighty God one day in judgment and have Jesus Christ as your defense lawyer. Can you imagine? The devil comes to the district attorney and says, look what Jim did in 1984. And Jesus stands up and goes, yeah, he did it. Covered in the blood. Look what Jim did in 19... Yep, did it. Covered in the blood. Every accusation against me, every accusation against you, what is Jesus going to say? It's covered in the blood. And the devil is going to try to say, well, look what you did. And I tell people this. And I had people at Fort Bragg. So well, I know what you did. I said, yeah. What are you doing about that? I'm doing nothing. Why not? It's nailed to a cross. I've been forgiven. Are you? Have you been washed clean by the blood? Or do you now wear the righteousness of Christ? You know, there aren't many places in the Bible we can clearly read the will of God. Very clearly. For this is the will of God. Look at verse 3. So if I want to know the will of God, where do I go? 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. Your sanctification that you should obtain from sexual immorality. That's the will of God. Are you following the will of God? Now, we've got physical fornication, but there's one that churches don't have very clear understanding of, and that is spiritual fornication. You cannot play with the devil and don't think you're not going to get burned. Many people, I, have, I know many Christians that read their horoscope. They're looking for their signs. What sign are you? Aquarius? Anybody else? Libra? The, who said that? Saved. There you go. That's the sign that I am. All that's demonic. All of that's demonic. I know people that read their horoscope in the newspapers in North Carolina all the time. I remember people coming and asking for prayer. Says, well, I just read the horoscope. It's really bad. Can you pray for me? How many of you tell people have good luck? That's witchcraft. We don't have good luck. We're blessed, exactly. 
you know? All of a sudden, your tire goes flat, and you go, oh, man, I'm out of luck. Oh, man, man, man. What's God doing to me? I'm going to be late for a meeting. Found out later that because of that flat tire, you just missed a derailing of a train. You're blessed. Everything that happens to you has a purpose. Some of it is for correction, and some of it is for training. Look what Paul writes in Romans 12, 1 and 2, when he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. We can do that in many ways. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do I renew my mind? By reading and studying the Word of God. Don't go looking for a translation. Oh, by the way, there's a new translation coming out, and I know most people would love it. And it's being written by the Chinese Communist Party. Man, I know their church is going to love that one. Do you, now, the communists, they, they, they wouldn't change anything, would they? I always wonder about why there's so many translations today. But the old saying is, follow the money. So what is God's perfect will for you? What is God's perfect desire in us? That we should live a righteous life. That we should be part of the kingdom of God. And that we should be lifting up and glorifying Him. This is the good thing. In Lamentations 3, verses 22 and 23, it says, And if you get off track, I'm paraphrasing, remember that God is gracious to forgiving. His mercy, His steadfast loves are new every morning. This is what's so great about being a Christian, that when I do fall, I've got a God that every morning, He's got a fresh love for me, a renewing of his love and his compassion for me, that I don't have to live in that past. I don't have to live with that sin and that shame that I had, that God has remade me new every morning. All I have to do is come to him and say, Father, I have sinned against you. Forgive me. And truly mean it in your heart. The Bible says we need to love one another. Speaking of love, it would be impossible to talk about righteous living without talking about love. God is love. And as we follow God, we learn all the more about his incredible love for his creation. He loved his creation so much that when Jesus died on the cross, he not only died for man, for you and I, but he died for all of creation. If you notice, his blood came, and where did it land? It landed on that old rugged cross. And then it landed on that earth, on the same earth that the first sin of Adam and Eve occurred. That blood came and restored all of creation. All we have to do now is surrender to him. God is love, and we must follow him and learn about that incredible love that he has for us and all of creation. Love is what sets us apart from others. As we love each other, it should reflect back on God. 1 Thessalonians 9, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 9. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you so in other words, the church in Thessalonica was what? Showing brotherly love. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, and indeed you do so towards all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. We need to continue with our love and our compassion. And we need to compare that love and that compassion 
for those sitting next to us, for those who God had put us in the same household, for those that God had created, maybe across the oceans. I remember when we went to Peru, people asked me, he says, why are we bothering going to Peru? You know, and I'll brag on him a little bit, but Bob Cady came to me and talked to me and says, we need to go on a mission trip. And I says, really? He says, yeah, we need to find something to go on a trip. So it came about, we had a, a possibility to go to Peru to help establish a church, thinking that we're going to go to Lima, plant a church, help them out, help them build a church. We got there, and we did. Chosica Church got done. San Diego got done. But then we ended up in Peru, in Pucallpa. And the men of the church, the people in the church got together and says, okay, now the ladies too. Says, okay, let's go to Pucallpa. And again, we're going to go there to do what? Build a church. And what happened? Well, let me tell you exactly how that happened. I'm sitting there on the airplane, and the, and the guy's sitting back behind us in the airplane, and they were discussing Mia. What can we do to help her? Well, then Jim Clary comes up and says, hey, we've been talking. that We need to do something to help this little girl. She had a heart murmur. She had a hole in her heart. I said, okay, we'll see. Prayed about it. Try to contact different places. Everything failed. Nothing. Got hold of Raleigh Hospital down in Indianapolis, and they said, you get her through the front door, it won't cost you nothing. So then I started working on the State Department to get her up here, and that, that fell through. I called all kinds of places. And then on a Friday, I decided to call one more place. And I didn't really pay attention to the time. It was out in California, and the phone rang. And the guy answered the phone. And I said, yeah, I'm trying to figure out a way. I've, we've never done this. How to bring this little girl to the States. Uh, how do we get her into the hospital to have her heart surgery done? And he goes, where is she from? I said, Peru. And he goes, well, you're talking to a surgeon that on Monday is going to Peru at the Lima, and we're going to set up a clinic, and we're going to do heart surgery. If you have her there on Monday, we'll take care of it. So we ended up having, the only thing we had to do was move her from Pucallpa to Lima. They did it. They got everything set up. They came back a few months later, did the operation. You see, that's the love of one another. Helping this little girl that will never give us anything in return. Not going to add a single person to the pews. But yet... For years, she was going around telling them how God gave her a new heart. And that came from, it started from an individual wanting to go do something. And hundreds, if not hundreds, of kids have come to Christ. Right now, Teco is going up and down the river building churches. Helping the indigenous Indians in the area. We're still doing it. That's the love of one another. We need to continue doing those things. Do it more and more. Love is a powerful testimony. Also, the next story I'll tell you is true, and those of you that were witnessed it that came to Pucallpa, we didn't have very good success the first year. We're struggling with getting people to come because there was a witch doctor in Pucallpa that was going around telling everybody that the gringos are coming down here to steal your children. You guys remember that? And Mia popped up. And not only did we save the life of, of Mia, but her testimony opened up the whole, all the doors for all those kids to come and get and be taught Jesus Christ. 
and they're still coming, and they're still being taught. When, when uh, COVID came, and it, they don't have welfare, they don't have Social Security, they don't have a, a, something to back them up, the whole country was shut down. Nobody could work. There was no food being brought in. And what did First Christian do? S- sent food to them. We're feeding roughly 185 to 250 kids three times a, d- a day. Had no place to eat. The problem we were having was being buying the food. There was no place to even buy food. We had to go and get stuff outside and bring it in. Hector on his little motorcycle. You guys remember Hector? He said he has to go and get food, but he has to skirt around the police because if he got caught in the streets, they would confiscate his motorcycle. And every day he would go and, and, and have people out where the police, where the roadblocks off, going down the back alleys to go get food to bring it to the church to feed the children. If he'd have lost that motorcycle, that was his livelihood. That's the love and the righteousness of Christ. So why do we do these things? 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. He sent his only son. He traded his son's life for ours. The righteousness, the righteous path is filled with the love of God. And the love of God performs the righteous path in us. Are you walking with Christ? Are you working for Christ? And to have the righteousness of God, we also must have respect and hard work. It took work, it took time to go down here this week. It took hard work to build that church in Pucallpa. I think, I don't know what year it was, the second or the third time we finally took drills, remember? The wood was so hard, you couldn't nail, you couldn't, you couldn't put a, you couldn't nail a, a nail through it. We ended up having to drill it and then nail it. Remember that? Now, nobody lost their temper. Nobody got upset. Hammers went flying just because they were sweaty and hot. You know, the love. Are we doing the work that shows the love of Christ? Paul's word in Thessalonians, in the small, the small section we just covered, chapter 4, it has a, has a practical part of it too. 1 Thessalonians, verse 11 and 2. that you also aspire to lead a quiet life to mind your own business. We ever heard that before? And to work with your own hands. Am I reading that wrong? As we command you that you may work, walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. So how do I lack nothing? Working hard. But how do I do that for my family? I've told past preachers this before. Had a young uh, uh, youth pastor. And he was cutting out of his duties because he says, well, my wife needs me by her side. And because God told me, I got to take care of my family. I got to take care of my wife. And I looked at him and said, you know the best way to take care of your wife? And he goes, what's that? He says, don't get fired. He says, how's that, how's that a better not help? How are you going to pay, bring food, and bring stuff to your family if you're not working? Go to work. And that means for our self-sustaining, but also for the kingdom of God. We must work for the kingdom of God. Paul adds that everything else depends on who we are. We need to depend on one another. We need to help each other. But we shouldn't be lazy. We shouldn't be unmotivated. 
We need to learn the value of work. If you're going to carry the righteousness of Christ, let your hard work be a testimony. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work in a manner that your heart is working for the Lord and not for men. Are you ready to truly put on the righteousness of Christ? How do we do that? By studying, by learning, and by putting the things into practice. We need to continue doing what we have done in the past. We need to continue working with the Lord so that we can reach the loss. Touch them. Fill their hearts. This church has done great in the last nine years that I've been here. And they've done stuff before, even before that. All we're saying is, let's continue the good work. Let us love one another. Let us encourage one another. And let us walk with the righteousness of Christ. And let people see Christ in everything that we do. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we worship you. We praise you. We invite you into our house. We invite you into our church. We invite you into our streets. We invite you into our hearts. Walk with us, Lord. We thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.